So in this lecture, we're going to expand on the topic principal components analysis. Um, last time we talked about um, different applications of principal components analysis to large high dimensional data sets. And what we're going to do today is talk a little bit more about the specifics of the mathematics and what's actually going on into the guts of the computation. Okay, so to remind ourselves uh, of the big kind of big high dimensional data we're talking about, uh, we have our data matrix X, which is a matrix of data where there are n samples and m measurements. Okay, so we have a uh, an m by m data matrix. Okay, now like we talked about last time, when n is anything larger than two or three just visualizing this data becomes extraordinarily difficult. Uh, we have to do all kinds of convolutions and, and uh, bend over backwards and maybe make tons of scatter plots in order to visualize the different slices of this data. And it still may not give us a good intuition of what's going on. So what PCA, what principal components analysis allows us to do is reduce this kind of big data and high dimensional data into something that can be explained in fewer dimensions so that we can Better, um, better visualize it and gain an understanding of what's actually going on. Because our suspicion is that, uh, hopefully, in this interesting data set, not all of the measures are complete, all, not all of the measurements are independent and kind of crazy, but there's actually correlations and structures and patterns in this data set. And that's what we want to discover. So I told you last time briefly that the principal components analysis, principal, um, is defined as the eigen decomposition, as the uh, eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix x transpose times x, this thing here. Okay, so we literally have to compute this matrix which if you look at the dimensions of our data matrix X, because it's M by M, if you take X transpose times X, this turns out to be an M by M matrix. Okay, so it's a square matrix where the size is determined by the number of measurements we have. And what you end up with when you take this eigen decomposition is a, uh, a set of eigenvalues and, a, and, and a, a set of eigenvectors and a set of eigenvalues. Now, we can use these eigenvectors and eigenvalues to describe our data, okay? And so let me show you exactly what I mean. What I mean is that if we take our data matrix X after doing this procedure and we obtain W, right, is that we can take our data matrix X, we're going to multiply it by W on the right side, and I'm going to call the resultant numbers T. And in the language of principal components analysis, we're going to call these, uh, these W, um, the columns of this W vector, uh, W matrix, we're going to call them the loadings. So you'll see people talking about principal components analysis using this, this terminology. Ws are called loadings. They're the eigenvectors of, uh, of X transpose times X. X is our data. And the Ts are called the scores. OK? So, so let's just remind ourselves of what this actually means. Now, what is the size of W? Well, since W are the eigenvectors of an M by M matrix, then W must be M by M as well. So M is M by M, okay? So if you take a, uh, an M by M matrix X and multiply it by a M by M matrix W, that means the, the, the size of T should also turn out to be M by M. OK? Now, furthermore, each column of W of W is a what we call a principal component. And because of the way that this object is, uh, is, uh, is constructed, we're going to order the columns of W by how large their corresponding eigenvalues are. 
So the largest eigen, the, so the so the so the principal component corresponding to the largest eigenvalue is always going to be the first one, and the next smaller one is going to be the second one, and the next biggest one is going to be the third one, and so on and so forth. Okay, and so columns of W are the principal components, and the scores you notice actually has exactly the same size as our original data matrix. It's because it's just a transformed way of looking at the data. We haven't actually changed the data. We're just looking at it a different way. We're turning this uh, high dimensional cloud of points and just kind of turning it and uh, describing it in a different basis vector. But the data itself hasn't changed. And you can see that partially because the sizes of things haven't changed. If, you, if I started out with n samples, I still have n rows of the T matrix, right? It's just that instead of having m measurements, I now have the projection of all of those measurements in w space instead of in my measurement space. And that's all that has really changed. Okay? And so one of the, the really cool things about this way of representing it um, comes back to this idea that these principal components, these, these columns of w, are ordered. And this is really important. Okay? So I'm going to write it down because this is something we need to remember. So these are ordered columns. by the value of the corresponding lambdas, the corresponding eigenvalues. Okay? Now, this has a really nice property that we can use. Okay? So remember we talked about in the beginning where I said that uh, having m measurements can be some kind of cumbersome. We can't even look at the data when it has too many, when the m is a number that's too large. Now, and you're going over here, you're looking at my T, my T matrix, my transform basis of description for my data, and you're like, well, I, that actually didn't get any smaller. How is this helping? Right? So I'm about to get to that point of how this helps. Now, because the columns of uh, W are ordered, it means that we can truncate them. It means that we can choose to take the first R number of components and say that, well, what if we had to explain our data by the first R components? Which ones will we pick? Okay, and this decomposition gives us a really nice and principled way of picking those R, right? So let's say R is 2 because I like plotting things in two-dimensional space. I know how to plot things in two-dimensional space. What I can do is pick the first two loadings, the first two principal components of W, right? And so what I literally mean is, so for, I'm, I'm going to assume that R here is 2, right? So I want a truncated basis of my principal components. So this is going to literally be the first R columns of W, right? So remember W is a M by M matrix where we have W1, this is the first principal component, W2, this is the second principal component, and so on and so forth until we have WM, which is the last principal component. Because we are guaranteed that the first one accounts for more of the variance in the data than the second one, than the third one, than the one after that, what we can do is truncate, literally chop off and only keep the first R columns. Right? So if I only wanted the first two dimensions of principal components, I will just take W1 and W2 and ignore the rest. Right? And then what we can do is go back and uh, multiply out uh, our representation of the data in that way. Right? Once I've taken the first couple of rows of W, whatever I pick, and 2 is usually a good place to start because you can look at 2, what I'm going to do is take my data matrix X, and instead of multiplying it by all of W, because W is an M by M matrix, I'm going to multiply it by W sub R. And R now is going to be um, a M by R matrix, where R could be a smaller number that you pick. And what you end up with is a truncated representation of the data, right? And here, this matrix is now going to be M by R. See how that worked? OK? So and if you don't believe me, go ahead and uh, convince yourself by the sizes of these matrices that this is actually true. So if I pick R to be 2, for example, I can compute the principal components analysis. I can compute the principal components by computing W. I can throw away everything except the first two columns of W. I can construct a, a truncated W sub R matrix multiplied by X, and I will come up with a two-dimensional representation of the same data. 
where I am basically guaranteed that these are the best two principal components, the best two truncated components of my representation of my data. Okay? And in order to compute the principal components analysis, there's a lot of built-in ways of doing it. And uh, uh, one of the ways that's built in for doing it um, is, uh, is there's, a, there's a function in MATLAB called PCA. And you literally just have to call PCA of your data matrix X. Um, and um, it's really easy to do. Um, and it has all kinds of options for if you have missing data, if you want uh, certain things that are specific to your particular data set, you can read the documentation um, of that particular function and figure out what's going on and uh, how, you can best, how you can best use um, the, the function for your purposes. Um, but this is sort of the, the picture you want to have in your head, right? So I'm going to try to, I'm gonna try to draw this out a little bit. Um, for a simple example like we started doing last time. So let's say that my data is actually two-dimensional, right? because that's what I can draw on the board. So m equals 2. And what I have is x1, x2, and I have a cloud of points like the following. right? So in this data set, m equals 2, right? which means my w matrix is going to be 2 by 2. right? And so let's say that I've computed my W by taking the PCA of my X matrix here, all of these points in two-dimensional space. And I want to say, well, I want to represent this data as one-dimensional data as much as possible. right? And so the intuition, by taking the eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix X transpose times X, is that the first eigenvector of w is going to be in the direction that explains most the variance in the data, which is this direction. So if you have a kind of a ellipsoid Gaussian cloud of points, it's going to, it's going to correspond to the, to, the, to the longest, biggest, the, the primary axis of that ellipsoid. That's where PC1 is going to be. So this is my w sub 1, right? And so if I use my truncated basis just to say r equals 1, right, then w sub r is is uh, is is uh, is going to be um, it's going to be two by one, right? I'm going to multiply that with my data matrix X, and I'm going to end up with a vector t, which is n by one, right? And so if I then do the transformation where I do x w sub one, what I'm going to end up with is one-dimensional data. Right? I've gotten rid of the second dimension as much as possible. This is now in the direction of W1. And I've literally taken this cloud and rotated it, because that's what matrix multiplication does. Right? It rotates and stretches numbers. And I'm going to end up with exactly the same cloud, where the relative locations of the points, the relative positions of the points, has not been changed. Right? So if two dots are next to each other here, so let's say that I have this dot and that dot, Right, and they're here. If I just rotate the entire thing, the relative, the relative distances between these two points has not changed. They're going to end up, you know, I'm going to make it up right here. It's going to be right there and right there. Right. So these two points have been rotated. I'm now describing them in a different basis, in the W basis rather than the measurement x1, x2 basis. But their relative locations has not changed. And that's really important as well. Right. PCA is not actually changing the data anyway. It's just a different way of looking at it. OK, so keep that in mind as we continue going. It's not, it's not changing your data. Anything that is next to each other in your data space is still going to be next to each other in principal component space.